So welcome to the last day. After all the week together, today we're going to talk about um, maritime applications with SAR. And we have today with us Dr. Domenico Velotto. He's coming uh, from the University of, Re of Bremen in Germany, where he works as a researcher. And before that, he was doing his PhD in SAR maritime applications in DLR. Um, so today we're going to cover topics like oil spills uh, and ship detection, and also this will include AIS. So this will be part of integrated applications between, uh, I mean, with Earth observation. Welcome, everyone. So good morning also from my side. Thank you, Amalia, for introducing me. So today we are talking about SAR marine applications and particularly oil spill and ship detections. So uh, here is the agenda for today. Yes. Sorry for this little technical issue. So, so I will try to uh, have the two topics covered in the two slots. So we we'll start uh, with some introduction about uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar marine applications. And then there are two fundamental parts that I would like to give you some basic information. So about ocean waves, so how the ocean uh, waves are generated, and some basic concept about SAR polarimetry because it's uh, some technique that um, uh, it's commonly used for oil spill and ship detection. And then we go to the topic uh, specification. So the first part is um, SAR oil spill detection with some uh, information about how oil spill happens and why. Then we have uh, the interpretation of um, oil spill with SAR. And then uh, I will show you some, some algorithms uh, using single and multipolarization uh, SARs. And more or less the same structure follows also for the, for the ship detection. So I will also give you some basic information about uh, what is the, um, the automatic identification system. And, uh, and then yeah, so uh, the interpretation of ship detection in SAR and uh, some algorithms uh, that are commonly used. So uh, general introduction. So on the right hand side here, you see a map which shows you general class classes of what we have on our planet. And you see uh, most of the of the Earth's surface is water, uh, and it's about 70%, so it's quite a lot. And when we talk about Earth observation, so you want to actually monitor also the ocean. So you are monitoring 70% of the Earth. So that's quite important. Um, and because it's a lot, so of course satellites come, come uh, into handy because they offer yeah, an optical an, a, a view from, from the from above. Uh, then we have also that oceans are important uh, because they provide resources, uh, non renewable and renewable sources of energy. So if you think about yeah, uh, exploit oil exploitation from the seabeds, and if you think about uh, wind farms, offshores, uh, then you have these kind of uh, sources. And another important point is that 72% of Earth's biodiversity lives in oceans. So that's why you want to protect, uh, uh, protect it, right? Um, how can we monitor the oceans? So, of course, uh, standard techniques. You have the in-situ measurements. You have... Uh, um, ships that are going out and taking measurements and you have uh, models that can predict how the ocean behaves, how the currents develop uh, around uh, the Earth's oceans. But these are expensive and they are punctual. So not always, it's not always easy to have um, a good overview about, about all the oceans. And that's why satellites come, come into play. 
today we are, we are talking about SAR, but these are not the only one uh, used for, for ocean monitoring. So um, we have um, spectral radiometers. They measure the lights in a wide uh, wave wavelength spectrum. And they are used for chlorophyll content, um, sea surface temperature, and so on. We have the microwave radiometer that measures the energy uh, emitted in the microwave spectrum, and they are commonly used for, yeah, again, for sea surface temperature, atmospheric water content, uh, and so on, salinity. Then we have the satellite, the altimeter, which measures the turnaround uh, time delay uh, of the electromagnetic pulse. And in this way, you can measure the sea surface height, ocean wind, uh, direction, and waves. So then we have the scatterometer that's also measure the scattered uh, energy while scanning the, the Earth's surface. And it's commonly used for, for wind speed um, and direction. So it's um, quite good instrument. Then we have the infrared uh, radiometer that uh, measure the radiation um, in the infrared light, and it's uh, specialized for sea surface temperature. And of course, the last one is SAR, so you should know uh, by the end of this course uh, what it measures. So it measures the uh, backscatter from, from the, the scene that is observed, and uh, we will see now for which applications uh, uh, is used in, in the maritime domain. Uh, yeah, so this is a slide which uh, shows you recap of uh, most of the application you can do with, with SAR. So we have, um, <clears throat> we have oil spill uh, and you can also monitor seepage. So oil seepage is the, yeah, what, what you find in the, yeah, under the, the ocean's floor. So it's a, yeah, a way to extract oil. Then there are studies about how the oil drifts. So this is also quite important because uh, in case of an oil spill, you want to predict how the oil is moving, if it's reaching the coast. So you need to take uh, special uh, measurements to prevent it. And there are also ocean edits that are quite important for, for current circulation and, and so on. Then we have uh, the ship detection and the wake. Uh, we will see it uh, yeah, in a, by the end of this uh, course, what it's about. Then we have, we have the land water line discrimination. This is also quite important for coastal erosion. Um, iceberg detection. So I don't have to tell you about Titanic, but uh, that's, uh, that's something that you can do with, with SAR. And of course, also the ice classification. So that's also quite important uh, nowadays to open uh, new routes on the on uh, north passages because then ships are shortening the travel between the continents. But it's quite dangerous because uh, if you don't know uh, the icebreaker where it has to go, and then it's uh, it happened that icebreakers were stuck in ice for 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 days, and that's quite dangerous. Then we also uh, wind, so wind speed retrieval, which uh, is also quite important for monitoring uh, typhoons and hurricanes. Here you see an example of, of a typhoon. Then we have the sea state or ocean waves uh, measurements, so measuring the, the wave height, the wave period, and this kind of parameter. Wave breaking is uh, when the waves approach the coast and breaks, so um, that's also quite important. And also uh, some, some bathymetry, so to study how the, the bathymetry uh, around some, some islands are developing. And we have also uh, surface current, so how the current, uh, the ocean current, basically. So these topics, they seem to be totally unrelated, but actually they are not. And nowadays, uh, it's always the case that you want to have all this information together, and not just one. Because 
for example, there is an oil spill. Then you want to see, for example, maybe who was uh, producing these oil spills. And then you need ship detection. But uh, then, for example, uh, you need also to have the current to estimate how the oil is drifting. So you want to know the, the meteorological condition around the oil spill. So which wind speed was, was, uh, was um, in place because as we will see, wind is also one component that uh, moves the oil on the ocean surface and so on. So these are um, kind of all together, but uh, today we are talking about the first two, so oil spill and ship detection. And if you're interested, you can find yeah, plenty of books about the other, the other topics. And to have some backgrounds before we start on the, on the technical part, um, I want to first talk about how um, you can monitor the ocean with SAR. And as ocean waters um, have high dielectric constant, so basically the radio waves penetration uh, is negligible. So SAR cannot uh, see under the water, you only have so-called surface scattering. So this should be uh, a concept that was uh, that you might already have heard in, um, in the basic uh, SAR um, yeah, seminar. And uh, of course, related to the surface scattering, uh, what is important is the roughness. So maybe you have also heard this. And um, what makes um, SAR observing the ocean is the roughness. And the roughness is caused by the ocean waves. And here there are some criteria, so the Fraunhofer criteria that tells you how you can discriminate when a surface is smooth or if it's, um, or if it's rough. And uh, a basic interpretation, what it happens when you have uh, a smooth surface. So basically, a smooth surface, you have the incidence wave that is sent by the satellite, by the SAR, then reflected uh, away from the sensor. And if uh, the surface starts to have some moderate uh, um, roughness, then part of this energy comes back. And this is what you measure. And of course, uh, the stronger is the roughness, the more um, you measure. And roughness in ocean is caused by the ocean waves, right? So I just want to tell you uh, how ocean waves are generated and they are generally classified by the forces that uh, they create them and that uh, the forces that flatten them and divided in two classes. So what is called the disturbing forces. So these are the energy that cause the waves and mostly so it's the wind, it's the gravity, yeah, uh, seismic activity and landslides that can generate waves. So seismic, seismic activity, you can think about, uh, yeah, if there is a plectonic uh, movement, then this will create a wave, of course. And then there are restoring forces, uh, which are the ones that try to smooth the, the, ocean, uh, the ocean waves. And this is basically the surface tension, cohesion, the gravity also tries to um, smooth the ocean surface. So um, wind is what uh, is the primary, primary disturbing force for generating what's so-called capillary and uh, capillary waves, so and wind waves. Uh, so here is um, a little description how it works. So basically, if you have wind blowing for a certain period of time in a certain location in the same direction, uh, you st it starts to transmit this energy to the ocean waves, to the ocean surface, sorry. And uh, it will start with small capillary ripple waves. And then step by step, it will fully develop uh, in what's so called fully developed sea. Um, and then uh, afterwards, uh, it will change as well, so to waves that have a longer uh, period. 
What is important for, uh, for SAR are actually the ripples, uh, because these ripples are the ones that are um, uh, on the same wavelength scale of the emitted pulses by the SAR. So um, just a little note uh, on this. So of course, I'm not an oceanographer, and um, the topic is very, very difficult and very, very large. So uh, I could not, of course, cover all the, the expert, but um, the point that I wanted to give you is that uh, you can measure, the, so you can observe the ocean because of the wind and the waves, because these are creating roughness. So it's not, uh, you see the ocean is smooth and you cannot, um, like for, for land application it's easier because you see buildings, you see big structure, you see bridges, and then it's easier. But for, for oceans, it's a bit different. So uh, that's the point I wanted to give you. So that we have the roughness over the ocean, and this is created by the wind and the waves. And uh, another point is, of course, the ocean is not static. So there is a lot of literature about how uh, the ocean movements uh, affects the um, imaging of the ocean surface by SAR, because um, you should have learned. So everything that is moving is not really um, a perfect match with SAR, let's say, because uh, with SAR you have like, uh, you, you think that everything is not moving and you are integrating, uh, you are integrating the so-called during the um, aperture, so the synthetic aperture, and you think that everything is Static, but is not. Um, so, of course, if you are interested, there are plenty of books you can read about it, you can study about it. So, the other part that I want to give you, I don't know how much details you got from the previous lectures about uh, polarimetry and what uh, wave polarization is. So, I've just a uh, very brief introduction about this topic. So the uh, wave polarization is, is the behavior of the electromagnetic, the, the electric field uh, that you observe. So the most uh, general um, polarization is what's so-called elliptical polarization that you see on the left-hand side a graph. And um, this is generated by uh, having the electric field x and y component not equal so the waves so the electromagnetic waves are moving along the z direction and changing the amplitude of uh, of the electric field x and y and having uh, also a rel relative phase different from 0 or 90 then you have the electric field vector which is giving you there in green that uh, follows an ellipse while the components are rotating, right? Then this specializes in the circular polarization, and uh, that's the case when the both components, x and y, are equal, and you have an, uh, a relative phase between the two components that is plus or 90 degrees. That means that, yeah, again, the vector, electric vector field, here in green again, it will give you like, um, yeah, a circle. And this is again specialized in linear polarization, where the components are equal in amplitude and also in phase. And um, in this case, it's uh, 45 degrees. So uh, you can have also linear polarization um, horizontal, which means you only have the x component of the electric field, and uh, vertical if you have only the y component. So. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the um, basic information about wave, electromagnetic wave polarization. So um, the most used uh, in SAR is uh, linear polarization because it makes uh, uh, yeah, uh, the life easier for uh, people building the, the sensor and also um, for managing the data. But there are uh, currently, um, satellites are also that use circular polarizations. 
So today we focus mostly on, on using linear, linear polarizations. Um, so what, what happens when the SAR then transmits the incidence, incident wave? So what it happens is that the scatterer, so the scene that you are observing, it changes the polarization state. And what you uh, get back is a transformation of, of, uh, of, of the, what you send. And this transformation is basically given you by the so-called uh, scattering matrix, which is given here by, by S. And you have, in the case of linear polarization, so meaning that you transmit uh, an horizontal H polarization and you receive H, transmit H and receive V, and uh, transmit V and receive H, transmit V and receive V. So you have the four combinations. Huh? So these are uh, here representing the, the so-called scattering matrix. And you can differentiate between um, a monostatic uh, radar and a bistatic radar. So monostatic radar is when transmitter and receiver are in the same location, like you see in the picture here on, on the right. So you see the, the radar transmit and receive on the same position. And bistatic is when you transmit from one position and you receive from another position. So there are bistatic radars available, uh, but today we focus on on monostatic case because it's the most um, yeah most satellites are, are monostatic at the moment. Another point is that each component of the scattering matrix, so um, uh, so-called complex scattering amplitude, it's composed of an amplitude and a phase. So you might have got this information also from yesterday lecture about interferometry. So also in polarimetry we make use of the phase information. It's not only the strength, but it's also how uh, the phase of between the incident and coming waves are, um, is measured, right? And what is also one point is that actually for the bistatic case, you have, um, you have the, okay, you have the copole, so-called copole scattering amplitude. They are called copole because they are, they are sending and receiving with the same polarization. And there are the so-called cross-pole channels, which means that you, you send in one polarization and you receive with the opposite. So the cross-pole um, scattering amplitude uh, values are usually uh, different if you have a bistatic uh, configuration, uh, but they are uh, almost equal although some, some except, exception applies, we will see later, for the monostatic case. So the monostatic case, you basically have uh, three complex uh, scattering amplitudes. Okay, I forgot to mention if you have questions, just raise your hand and we try to answer your questions. Um, Last point uh, is about how this is important uh, when you observe the Earth's surface. Huh? So on the le left hand side, you see some uh, so-called canonical uh, scattering uh, um, configuration, let's call it. And what is the resulting scattering matrix, right? So you have like, so vertical dipole, it means that you only will receive a vertical component and the other components will be null. If you have an horizontal dipole, you get only the horizontal um, component. If you have a diedral, you will have both copole, but uh, HH and VB are out of phase. And if you have a triedral, you have HH and VB with cross polarization null. And in this case, they are uh, indeed in phase. So um, I, I guess you also have heard about the different scattering uh, mechanism you can observe with, with, with radar. Here it's kind of recap. So you have 
surface scattering, which you usually observe with uh, bare soil or, or sea surface. And these are characterized by yeah, having uh, the cross pole scattering amplitude almost uh, zero. And usually you have the VV component that is uh, larger than the HH component. And um, the phase difference between VV and HH is uh, almost zero or zero, which means uh, that if you take uh, the absolute value of uh, the sum of HH and VV, you have a, a value that is high. And on the right hand side, you see a SAR image, which is uh, showing you, for example, um, over the ocean, you get um, HH plus VV that is dominant am among the other components. Then you have the volume scattering, which is a uh, case of uh, forest or buildings uh, in some cases. In this case, you have uh, that both uh, copoles are high, uh, but um, the cross pole is usually larger than the other ones. And if you color code this in green, you see, for example, here in the San Francisco Bay, you see that the green is dominant, for example, over a vegetated area. And then you have double bounds, right? So double bounds happens uh, a lot in urban areas. These are characterized by yeah, HH being larger than VV and a phase difference uh, equal to pi, which means that if you have the, yeah, the amplitude of the difference between HH and VV complex uh, scattering amplitude, then this value is high. So if you color code this in, in green, then you see in, in the, you know, where the arrow points that you have a uh, predominant uh, green value, uh, sorry, red value over, over the cities, for example. So of course, uh, what, I, what is in, interesting for us is the surface scattering because it's what is happening over the ocean and double bounds uh, for, for the ship detection that we will see later on. Um, okay, some, some um, some other basic information that uh, we will use. So usually the, um, to retrieve the geophysical information, um, the scattering matrix is useful for point target, but not useful for distributed targets. And when you want to retrieve uh, information about distributed targets, uh, then uh, you need to vectorize the scattering matrix with a transformation, which is, which is given by here. So the trace of the multiplication between the scattering matrix and uh, um, C where C are orthogonal spin matrices. And in polarimetry, you will he hear about uh, two of these orthogonal uh, spin matrices. One is called lexicographic, which is given by CL. And the other one is the poly uh, representation, which is given by CP. Here are uh, the equation and if you substitute this in the transformation above, then you get a vector representation of the scattering matrix, which is given by KL and KP. Right, so these vectors are, are quite useful. And um, if you want to measure the total power of what is called the span uh, of whole components that you receive from, from radar, uh, this is given by the span, so it's the square modulus of the sum of the three components. Uh, why the uh, vector are useful? Because with these vectors, then you can uh, create um, so-called yeah, second order statistics, uh, so the covariance and coherency matrices, 
which are, so the first is given by C3, and the second one is given by the T3. So here it's a, a vector multiplication between, the first is given by the vector multiplication between KL, and the, is adjoint. And here you see what, what um, the operators are doing. So the asterisk, it means conjugate, so opposite in phase. So the complex value is opposite in phase. And um, curly uh, brackets, it means averaging. So you need to go, when you want to study a distributed target, you need to average around a pixel to get um, a second order statistics. So that's uh, um, another representation of, uh, of the covariance matrix, which is basically putting the HH component in common. So you have, uh, so the C3 will be represented by yeah, the matrix that you see there above. And this is quite nice because it gives you already some so-called polarimetric features. So, for example, sig with sigma, we usually denotate the channel power. So um, then you have uh, some other features that are the delta and gamma, which are the cross and copole polarization ratio. And then you have uh, the interchannel correlation parameters, um, which, for example, uh, Rho should be familiar to you from the yesterday lecture because in interferometry you also used coherence. In that case, you have two complex images acquired in different times and you have coherence. Here in polarimetry, you have two different uh, channels, so the HH and VB, and you can estimate the, the correlation between these two channels. Okay. That's uh, some, some of the parameters here are used uh, for oil spill and ship detection. And that's the reason why I wanted to give you a little bit of overview. Um, then we have um, also the so-called um, eigenvalue decomposition of, of, for example, the coherency matrix, so you can do it uh, the same with the co covariance matrix. So uh, this is a quite important analysis if you want, if you want to discriminate uh, which uh, scattering mechanism is happening uh, on the observed scene. So from the T3, for example, uh, you have three eigenvalues, which normally the first one is larger than the second one, which is larger than the third. And in the case you uh, estimate uh, these values and only the first one is different from zero, then uh, you can be sure that uh, the dominant scattering mechanism in the observed scene is a, a scattering, is a single, is, is single scattering mechanism. It can be one of the three, but it's only one. Uh, and then you can go from this kind of, uh, now, from this case to the most random case, which is when the three eigenvalues are almost equal and different from zero. And this is uh, happening when you have partially polarized scatters. And with the eigenvalue, um, you can uh, yeah, retrieve some other polarimetric features, which are given here. So you can estimate the randomness of what is happening in your scene with the entropy, uh, which is basically the sum of the probabilities of each eigenvalues, where the probabilities are given by pj. Then you can uh, have the so-called uh, average alpha angle, uh, which is uh, telling you, uh, yeah, so it spans from zero to 90 degrees, and it tells you if you are observing an odd bounds or an uneven bounds, or in the case of 45, if you have multiple bounces. And then you have the anisotropy, 
which also span from 0 to 1, and which is yeah, less used because it's kind of complementary to the entropy. Uh, but just for your information, you, you can also have uh, this. Of course, uh, another a little note. So, um, so the time is not enough to cover all the polarimetric uh, techniques. Uh, today we are going to focus on a marine application, um, but um, there are also um, other techniques uh, which uh, are so-called model-based decomposition. So you try to decompose the scattering matrix on some model assumptions and see when it happens, surface, volume, and double bounds. But they are not covered because of of the time and because I want to stop boring you with uh, mathematical stuff and uh, show you some example about uh, maritime applications. Um, just a little note, so PULSAR is the abbreviation for polarimetric SAR. In a nutshell, you have uh, the radar is composed by having two receiver channels and two antennas. And as I said, uh, you see the diagram here. That means that you transmit, for example, uh, H, so linearly polarized uh, horizontal, and then you receive at the same time H and V. So this will give you the component HH and HV. And then you switch polarization, you transmit in V, and then you have the VH and VV. And this is how you construct the, the scattering matrix. So some, some notation. So normally, uh, this um, mode is either called fully polarimetric or quad polarimetric uh, radar, which is meaning that you get all four combinations. So when you get uh, the SAR image, you will actually have not one image, but four. And um, this is uh, because you are doubling the PRF, so as I've shown you before. So PRF stands for pulse repetition frequency, because you have to switch between the H and B in transmit. But you have also the so-called dual pole uh, combination, which means you are only um, uh, receiving uh, the combination HHHV or VHVV and also the combination HHVV, which uh, for certain uh, yeah, SAR missions, uh, in some case, this uh, HHVV combination is called twin mode. In some other cases, it's called alternating polarization. Some other satellites, you find it calling ping pong mode. So uh, what here, so uh, important is, is that uh, the HHVV uh, combination which is coherent, which means that the phase information between the two polarization is kept, is not um, thrown away, uh, requires also a doubling the PRF. And when you double the PRF, uh, you get some side effects on, on, uh, on your side image. So basically, your SWOT coverage in range reduced to half compared to a single polarization. And uh, also the spatial resolution is actually twice worse in azimuth, not in range. And um, yeah, so there are side effects. You acquire more information, but at the cost of coverage and resolution, which are two factors that plays a role in maritime applications. So to show you the first case, so what I mean by reducing the coverage, so what, what you can see here is um, a Google map overlay of two acquisitions from satellite. This is the, um, yeah, the so-called tandem mix um, configuration. It's composed of two satellites which for a certain period of time, they were basically flying uh, one from another in a very short baseline, so about 10 seconds, so 76 kilometers, quite 
uh, near to each other. So, and then, so the first satellite acquired an image over an oil spill, and the, the, the side image is given by the, uh, the frame in red. And you see uh, this dark uh, area in the middle of the image, which is, uh, which is an oil spill. And then the satellite that comes after, 10 seconds later, it observes the scene almost at the same time, so 10 seconds after. And in this case, was using quad pole mode, which then you see that uh, the coverage, uh, so in the range direction, or across track, uh, how you want to call it, it's actually off. And uh, of course, uh, this is a limitation because you see in the polarimetric case that you only cover part of the oil spill. So and you cannot uh, observe the complete, um, the complete scene. The other, <coughs> the other effect is, <coughs> uh, yeah, so the reduction in the spatial resolution. And this is uh, something that is important for, for ships. If you want to detect ship, of course, uh, higher the resolution, the better. And again, this is the same. So from that data set, the same ship observed by uh, the first satellite towards Terrazar X. And uh, on, on the map here on top, you see the ship uh, using the single pole HH, which has a resolution of um, range and azimuth about 1.7 by 3.3. And uh, on the bottom, you see the HH channel ac acquired with the quad pole mode, right? So the effect of the loss in resolution, you can see it, right? So here, the two pictures are, so the rather signal, signal strength is color coded from blue to red. So red means you get very high backscatter. So most of these, points are kept, so you see that there is a quite a good match, uh, at least in the uh, left part of the ship. Uh, but on the right part of the ship, you see that there is some, some um, loss in, the, in, this, um, yeah, in this pixel with, with strong backscatter. And so this is a, not a very large ship, it's a ship that's about uh, 60, 67 meters, and the width is 14. So um, on the right hand side, you see uh, so basically the plot showing how uh, the scattering change uh, on top uh, along the range profile. So summing all the columns and then just plotting it. And in red is the single pole and in, um, Cyan, uh, the quad pole, you see, so the peaks are almost um, um, corresponding, but you have some, some, some loss, for example, in the, the right hand part, especially in here. And the same you can do it also in the azimuth profile. So this is some side effects that you have to take into account uh, when using uh, Pulsar. Um, so, some, some basic information also about uh, which modes you can have uh, with SAR. So, so um, basically you should already have this information, but um, SAR is very flexible uh, instrument because um, it allows to have either large SWOT, so large coverage with low resolution or very high resolution with uh, a little coverage. So just to have some acronyms or some commonly used uh, yeah, uh, terms. So you usually have, uh, so the scansar mode is the, the mode where you have uh, very large coverage. Here on the right hand side is 
the red one. And basically there are so-called scans are white and normal scans are. And with these modes you can cover, here you cover basically uh, the German byte, so completely. Uh, but these modes have so-called low resolution, so you range from 40 meters, the white mode, to 18 meters, the normal mode. Of course, these modes are specialized, or uh, this um, resolution and coverage is specialized in the case of Terra Sarix, but you can find uh, the same for other uh, SAR missions, um, also with Sentinel-1, or with uh, Cosmos Kamed, or with RadarSat, so they are mostly uh, common uh, acronyms. Then you have the standard uh, mode, which is so-called strip map, uh, because it's basically the satellite is moving and is scanning uh, in a strip. Uh, and uh, this is somehow giving you a good balance between uh, resolution and coverage because you have, for example, in Terra Zarix, um, SWAT width of 30 kilometers and you can go down to 2 to 3 meters resolutions. Uh, and then you have the spotlight mode, uh, which is the very high resolution. But you see, you cover very small portion of the Earth. So um, the modes that allows you to have also polarimetry are the strip map and spotlight. Especially the strip map, you have uh, the different combination of dual poles. So you have uh, the HHV combination, the VHVB combination, and the HHVV combination. Uh, for Terrazarix, uh, the spotlight will only give you the HHVV combination. So, in which applications are these modes used? For, for example, the scanner are normally used for, for oil, for ship, for coastline, so iceberg, so you have very large coverage. Uh, strip map are also used for oil and ship, so also for, for wake, iceberg, and also specialized for, for wind and waves estimation. Uh, and then, for example, uh, there are for, for Terra Zarix, uh, uh, an experimental mode that is called uh, yeah, DRA, that stands for dual receive antenna. So the antenna is split in two to acquire uh, either quad pole or the along track interferometry. So uh, you have heard about this technique. And the DRA mode is something that uh, is used for, for oil and ship, or also for, for current. So um, let's dive a little bit on the topic about oil spill. Uh, so first, uh, first of all, definition of oil spill, what it is. So uh, oil is a very generic term, so it's really uh, denotating all the kind of um, petroleum pod products that you, you find, and um, especially uh, crude oils uh, are made up of a you know, wide spectrum of hydrocarbons, so ranging from very volatile components to very heavy components. And uh, what is defined as oil spill? Uh, as you see here, is a violent spillage due to human activity. And this means uh, human activity can be anything. It can be um, a platform, accident, a tanker that is sinking, or some uh, routine operations that are done by the, by the old tankers. And uh, I don't have to tell you, but uh, so these are a very uh, 
strong threatening for, for, for the environment. So that's why uh, it's very important to monitor oil spill and give uh, the information about oil spill extent, where it's moving, because then the right uh, measurements can be taken to um, yeah, limit uh, the damage. Uh, what sources of oil spill we have? So we can have oil spill either on land or on ocean. So actually on land, on the left hand side, you see a big portion of oil spill on land uh, is, is happening. Uh, it's also a, an environmental threat, but in that case, it's easier to manage. So the response in case something happened, because you're on land, so it's easier. So unfortunately, also a big portion uh, it happens on, on, on oceans, and uh, there are different reasons. So yeah, you see here some statistics. So 20% is about uh, tanker operation and accident, 6% uh, tanker operations, 6% tanker accidents, yeah, a little amount about terminals and work sites. And um, on the right hand side, you see uh, yeah, an extraction of the largest oil spill in history. And uh, you see where, you see the name uh, in this list. Uh, but what I want to point out is that actually, if you see this list, so accidents that are involving tankers rank uh, top in the number, but not in quantity. So that uh, seems strange, uh, but uh, this is not something that happens once, it's happening continuously. So small and small spillages are there. Uh, and it's also not very easy to estimate uh, uh, the amount if this is happening um, due to uh, yeah, routine operations. Um, some of these or some of these oil spill uh, they are actually quite famous because of they were announced in the media uh, because they were like threatening some specific geographical area or like. I mean, you probably have heard about the deep water horizon oil spill, but um, there are many, many others involving uh, uh, platforms. And besides, uh, so what is uh, an accident and causing a noise spill during an accident, uh, there are also three types of routine ship operations which pollute uh, the sea. With, with oil or oil water mixtures. These are so-called uh, ballast water, uh, which means mainly involves uh, tankers, so not passenger ships or not uh, yeah, pleasure ships. Uh, then there is also tank washing procedure. This also involves mainly tankers. And uh, also the engine room effluent uh, dischargers. So tankers basically are doing this because uh, they want to save time and money because usually you should reach the port and uh, go to the facility and uh, clean your ballast water and so on. But save time, you just throw it in the ocean and that's it. So and then you, you save time and money. Uh, of course, what, uh, what has been done to prevent uh, this, we have from, from one side, we have prevention with, uh, with conventions and regulations. And you have, of course, monitoring and surveillance because then you need to be, you, de, you need to ensure that these regulations are, are kept. 
So on the left hand side, uh, so the most uh, yeah, comprehensive uh, regulation about maritime uh, prevention of pollution by oil is given by the International Maritime Organization, it's called MARPOL, and specifically the Annex 1. So here you see uh, what is actually allowed, what, what is not allowed by the different types of ships. So on the top you see like uh, for ships which are larger than 400 uh, gross tonnage and for oil tankers grosser or bigger than 150 gross tonnage, um, you cannot discharge more than 15 parts per million of, of oil in, in your oil water mixture. And uh, this is allowed, so the maximum is allowed uh, when the ship is en route and 12 miles from the coast. And this uh, convention is also defining the so-called special areas. Special areas which are Mediterranean Sea, Baltic Sea, Black Sea, and so on, you see the list there. In special areas, uh, the deliberate spillage of oil in any quantity is forbidden. So then you have also the discharge of oil from, from cargo and ballast space. This is a little bit more restrictive, restrictive and is um, only applying for oil tankers which are larger than 150 gross tonnage and the regulation says that the ship has to be 50 miles from the land, it should be en route and you cannot discharge more than 30 liters per nautical miles when you are, you are moving. So then there are special regional convention like for example in the Baltic Sea you have the so-called HELCOM convention um, or Helsinki convention um, uh, which are more uh, restrictive and the way uh, you how you can uh, ensure that these regulations are um, obliged it's via monitoring and surveillance and uh, satellite is a great help on this side and so the European Maritime Safety Agency, so the EMSA, has established since more than 10 years a program that is called uh, Clean CNET, which is the European satellite uh, based oil spill monitoring and vessel detection service. So all the members of EU through the EMSA can uh, make use of this service. So you have the offer is they can do routine monitoring. Uh, so images are planned to cover certain areas. Um, and you can have emerg emergency responses. So if something happened, uh, so the service comes into play and help uh, the member state and then there is also specific pollution monitoring operations uh, which you plan some, some for example some aircraft surveillance uh, over a specific area or if a member state has um, a doubt of an oil spillage going on so they can uh, come into play of course so EMSA is part of Copernicus and of course is making use uh, a lot of Copernicus data so mainly uh, the service is based on synthetic aperture radar images but they use also uh, optical image for, for recognizing ships for example and um, 
of course, they use Copernicus data and Sentinel-1. Um, what, um, uh, what sensor do we have? Which remote sensing technique uh, are used for, for oil spill? So here is a, a little table summarizing what, what is available. Either, so we have two columns, actually three columns. So uh, the type shows you which sensor uh, and some, uh, yeah, some information that <coughs> are useful for, for oil spill monitoring. And then the division between what are the optical sensor doing and the microwave uh, doing. So in the optical you have, yeah, visible sensor, infrared, ultraviolet, laser fluor sensor, and <coughs> in the microwave you have, yeah, the microwave radiometer and also SAR, so the synthetic aperture radar and side look airborne radar. So this is, uh, SLAR is normally used on airplanes because it's easier, the processing. So the aircraft, uh, while scanning, uh, it's also giving uh, the image live. So and then the operator can see if there is a, an oil spill or not. Uh, yeah, so of course there are differences between these sensors. Uh, in which weather condition they can operate. So you have some that can operate without clouds, like the microwave operates without clouds uh, or with clouds. And wow. the optical, you mostly need uh, a clean sky. Otherwise, uh, you cannot observe uh, the scene. And uh, 24H operation means you can use this sensor day and night. So some can do their night, some not. Some have uh, high resolution, some have lower resolution. Uh, some have uh, small to medium to high uh, coverage, we have seen. Some can provide uh, the oil thickness information. Some can not, for example, SAR cannot retrieve the information. Already that told you that you get, so the microwaves are not penetrating into the oil. So, and that's why you cannot also doing the classification oil. You cannot say which type of oil it is, but other techniques can do it. So like the laser fluor sensor, for example. And uh, yeah, some, some have some types of false alarm, some others are not. So, this is, yeah, uh, a summary more or less of what, what is available. Uh, of course, SAR is the one that is most generic, but cannot do everything alone. So actually you need uh, help of other sensors. And this is what actually happens during the routine operation. So SAR is actually used uh, as a early warning system, so you pass over by the satellite, you have some uh, hotspot identified, and then the patrol control, or the maritime patrol control, will either fly over the area or go by ship and check what, what is happening. Uh, some examples, finally. So here, you see two pictures comparing an oil spill. With, on the left-hand side, you have a multispectral optical image acquired by the MODIS Aqua satellite from, from NASA. And this was acquired during uh, an oil spill uh, on an oil platform in Timor Sea, so close to Australia. And the oil, in the optical image appears sometimes, in this case, uh, dark blue, but sometimes you have this uh, shining effect, which uh, gives you uh, 
light ray uh, vision of the oil. So this depends on the sun glint, so how the optical satellite is looking at the scene. And on the right hand side, you see the same image, this, uh, the satellite SAR image acquired by Terrasar X, uh, covering the area given by the dashed line. So, a couple of hours after, I guess, yeah. So, three to four, four hours after uh, the optical image. So, you see they, they quite match to each other. Of course, optical, uh, it's uh, an easy, uh, yeah. It's easier for human to recognize what is happening there. And on the right hand side, so the oil spill area, I can already pronounce you, is where you have this large area of low back scatter, so this dark area in the image. Uh, then another example, uh, this, uh, again, comparing the optical with, uh, with SAR. So on the left hand side, uh, the image acquired by the MVSAT Meris uh, multispectral uh, sensor during the deep water horizon oil spill, so on the Gulf of Mexico. This was very, yeah, uh, a large uh, accident, also, yeah, given by the media, a lot of information. So this was one of the first image after after the event, and actually the SAR satellite that is on the right hand side was actually acquired before the, the optical image. And of course you see in the optical image, you see clouds in the right uh, bottom corner of the picture, largely was not covering the, the oil spill area, which here, for example, is, yeah, giving you this light gray color. Uh, and then you also see, comparing the two images, that, uh, so we ha you have this atmospheric front that is moving uh, south, uh, east, to north, east, to north, uh, west, which uh, basically moved this big, yeah, polluted ocean surface towards the the ocean, the, the the land coast. So this is why having multiple observation, also using multiple satellites with multiple technique, is is always good because in this case could be better prevent what what are the action to take into account. And as a matter of fact. Uh, so the oil spill uh, was, uh, the deep water horizon oil spill was going on for, for days. And uh, here, just to show you like another SAR image that was acquired later on. So it was three months after the first event. So, and you see, for example, in this uh, uh, zoom, uh, so the, pollution control agency, they tried to uh, fight against the oil moving towards the coast, creating this uh, artificial barrier. But so the accident was so large that they could not actually prevent uh, the aged oil uh, to approach the coast. Yeah, so that, that is mostly some what, what you can do with remote sensing. Uh, let's dive a little bit how this is happening and why you see uh, dark uh, as an oil spill is happening uh, in a SAR image. So this illustration gives you yeah, a complete picture of what is happening. So you have uh, oil, so you, we have already seen that you have the ocean with uh, 
its roughness. And when the satellite is uh, yeah, transmitting the, the pulse and receiving the pulse from clean ocean, clean ocean uh, sea surface, then you have some uh, backscatter received from the satellite. While when you have oil, which is this black uh, part in the picture, this basically, the oil is smoothing the surface. And this means that <coughs> the radar energy is cut away from the sensor. So you receive less uh, backscatter. Hmm? Uh, what time we do? More or less now, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? OK. Uh, I don't know, what do you prefer? Do you prefer to? Go more in the, into details now about uh, this, or have coffee break now, if you... And, and also ask questions, because mm. so far we did, you didn't have much interaction yeah. with Dominic. I do have a question, please. Please. Uh, before you talked about the oil spill, right? So the question is, like, how fast can you detect the oil spill? How fast? Yeah, because, like, the satellite can go, I think, in one hour, uh, not, 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 uh. One and a half. So, I mean, in one hour, it will be like the damage is done if there is zero. So, how is the, like, technical, how is the procedure in this case? Uh, so, you are, you are talking about an accident. Yeah. Right, so you have, yeah. like, I mean. So, the satellite detects it. So, what is the So, the, the procedure that is, um, <clears throat> For example, applied by EMSA, it's the so-called uh, near real time. So basically, if there is an accident, the first satellite overpass is taken, taking a picture. This means that uh, from the SAR acquisition to the delivery of the information to the end user, like the maritime petrol control. Huh? it takes about 20 to 30 minutes. This is what uh, EMSA, for example, is delivering to the member states. So the near real time for both oil and ship detection, it's like you count the time from the satellite acquisition to the delivery, it's about 20 minutes. So. Of course, you're not sure that there had been a satellite acquisition just after yeah. the oil spill. Yeah, yeah, that's of course. I mean, I, that's why I said after uh, the first satellite overpass, it acquires an image, and then from that, that means it depends also where the oil spill is happening, which uh, satellite is uh, using, because normally, so what the SAR acquires is the raw data. So the raw data then needs to be sent to the ground to be focused. So the raw signal is then focused in an image. And from that point on, you can run the algorithm about oil and ship and then deliver this to the, to the end user. So of course, this depends also on the, on the ground station coverage. So, so as a as different partnership with different ground station operators around the world. So, uh, and I guess for Sentinel, you have also this uh, relay with. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, just uh, one uh, concept I want to say the fact that the one satellite orbits one and a half hours doesn't mean that every one and a half hours a satellite is passing on the same spot huh? because they have to rotate. So, in the case of Sentinel 1, for example, if you are only Sentinel 1A, it takes 12 days before you have a acquisition so all the same place. If you are Sentinel 1A and B, then it's every six days. But thanks God, there is not only Sentinel. There are Sentinel, Radarsat, uh, Cosmos Climate, uh, etc., etc. So, EMSA <laughs> is collecting the satellite acquisitions from all the different satellites. And then, uh, of course, it's much more frequent. I mean, you have also to distinguish the the 
repeat pass, which is really the satellite, because satellites are orbiting in, uh, in LEO orbit, so, and polar orbit, right? So with the same exact geometry, it's what uh, Francesco told you. So you have 12 days, which means the same geometry, but because SAR is quite flexible, you can uh, steer the beam of the antenna, right? So you can, okay, not the case of, of Sentinel because it's uh, acquiring always with specific mode, but other satellites like Cosmos Climate, Radarsat, you have, yeah. you have different acquisitions. So the coverage, uh, the revisit time reduces. So you have like two to four days more or less. Let's say that for this type of acquisitions, you can also combine different images which are taken with different incidents. Yes, it's not yes, like of interferometry. Yesterday we saw interferometry. Then you need always exactly the same geometry. No, no, no. That's that's yeah. different. So in this case, even if you have a you you, you can effect. change the the let's say the, the acquisition geometry of the satellite. So do you want to have a question? Or do you want to have a break? Oh. Okay, then uh, let's have a break. Uh, so 15 minutes break. 15 minutes break, okay.